I'm going to ask you to imagine something. Please close your eyes and picture a person who lives and works in space 15 years from now. What do they look like? Where do they come from? What do they study in school? What is their job in space? Have you got it? Okay, open your eyes. When I asked you to imagine a person who lives and works in space 15 years from now, did you picture yourself? I hope so, because space needs you. And I think the question that each of us may get to answer sooner rather than later is, do we need space? My name is Shana Gifford, and as you can tell by the way I'm dressed, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm also a journalist, a photographer, and a simulated astronaut. A simulated astronaut is somebody who practices living and working in space, so that when we finally go to space, we can succeed there. Olympians spend years swimming laps in regulation pools before they go for the gold, and physicians train and train and train for the better part of a decade before we're allowed to treat patients on our own. But the principle of practice makes better pretty much applies to all skills. And if you have ever joined a team or taken a CPR class, gone on a date, or participated in a fire drill, you too have taken part in a kind of simulation. And when you finally went to run that race or save that life, that simulation prepared you for success. Simulations have been a critical part of NASA's mission since forever, <laughs> since we began human spaceflight. The first Apollo simulation was in 1966. During that simulation, the power failed, it basically rained inside the command module, and the crew discovered that their underwear was venting toxic fumes. <laughs> they were forced to eject it out of the airlock. So much broke during that first simulation that it had to be ended early. That's not to say that it wasn't a success. In fact, after that simulation, life-saving changes were implemented. Dehumidification systems were redesigned, and space underwear was re-engineered. And by 1969, we were able to land on the moon and come home without having to eject any clothing out the airlock for safety reasons. My crew learned a lot, too, by spending a year on simulated Mars. One of the things we learned is that not everyone could fit well inside our simulated spacesuits. But like so many things about our mission, what was a challenge was also an opportunity. And by halfway through the mission, we were working with designers back on Earth to build a new simulated spacesuit. The result, you see before you, the Mars Suit 1, the world's first fully adjustable analog spacesuit for analog Mars. This spacesuit would fit anyone on my crew, and with a little adjustment, probably any future Mars simulated astronaut. Even better, this spacesuit mimics, in shape and weight, NASA's own design for a Mars spacesuit, the Z2. So by wearing the MS-1 on simulated Mars, we can begin to understand what doing an extravehicular activity on real Mars might be like in a suit of this type. What tasks we can do, how far we can explore, and how long we can wear the suit before our explorers get tired. This is just one example of how space simulations are taking us really far in space, but also how much further we have to go. Which is why, as we all speak tonight, Four simulated astronauts at Johnson Space Center are getting ready to isolate themselves inside a module for 45 days and practice the journey to an asteroid. Now, they won't be practicing the zero gravity and no pressure part. We'll get to that someday. Right now, we're just working on the basics. Growing food, conserving water and power, maintaining the dome, and dwelling inside of it peacefully with a very small number of people for a very long time. My crew and I practiced this on the hillside of a barren volcano called Mount Aloha in Hawaii for 366 days straight, making our simulation and our experiment the longest one in NASA's history. And for all that time, 
we spoke to no other humans in real time. We never went more than a kilometer or two from the dome. And, like real astronauts, I never stepped outside without a spacesuit on. When I came back to Earth, I started talking to people about what a year in space is like, how we ate mostly dehydrated food, and occasionally had to purify water by hand and had to clean composting toilets. Always by hand. And I rapidly learned that what people think of as astronaut material could use just a bit of adjustment. Yes, yes, between us, we had a lot of academic degrees. But at the end of the day, the PhDs and MD and engineering degree from MIT took a back seat to our primary jobs. Over the 380 days I've spent in simulated space, I've learned that the practical aspects of life in space are the most critical ones to success, hands down. The cooking, the cleaning, the communicating back to Earth, culturing food, repairing electronics. The longer and longer we go, the further and further out, the more and more important these basic, essential skills become. And the more and more valuable people with expertise in these skills are to the space effort. That is a radical change from the way we started in space. Think about it. In the 1960s, if you ask someone, what does an astronaut look like? They would show you a picture of a Caucasian male member of the US or Russian military. If you ask someone in the 1990s what a person who lives and works in space looks like, I hope they would show you a picture of a scientist, physician, or engineer of any race, color, or orientation from one of two dozen countries. When I asked all of you to imagine the near future space person, did you come up with something like this? These are the realities of our near future in space. It's been an amazing adventure. It started as a military operation, once upon a time. Now, it's a scientific one, and I hope some part of it stays that way. But pretty soon, more and more people from more and more diverse walks of life are going to be staying longer and longer in space to support our life here on Earth. They'll be occupying near-Earth orbit, and maybe the Moon, and maybe even Mars, in an attempt to support the way we live on Earth today. This is not a dream. It's not just a wish. It's not even an option. There is not enough room on the planet for the amount of information we want to move at the speeds we want to move it. The growth of telecommunications alone is going to require that we move large-scale operations into near-Earth orbit permanently. Fortunately, for the last 17 years, a few hundred people have been practicing how to live and improving how we work in space. As a result, we've gotten pretty good at surviving in near-Earth orbit. I predict that 17 years from now, several hundred people will be living simultaneously in near-Earth orbit supporting our telecommunications and space rigs, building our satellites and spacecraft better, cheaper, and faster in orbit. And those people, I don't think, will have three years to spend space the way that astronauts do now. I don't think they'll have years and years to train to dedicate their entire lives to it. I think they're going to resemble less the astronauts of today, and definitely not the astronauts of the 1960s. I think they're going to look a lot like you. I think they're going to look like a lot like the people who work in Antarctica today. There are scientists in Antarctica, sure, but there are more people there who are not. They are builders and welders and firemen working in one of the most adverse environments on the planet. We're going to need all those people if we're going to make it in the most adverse environment in the universe. We're going to need IT engineers and butchers and bakers and barbers. We're going to need nurses and plumbers and, yes, sanitation engineers. We're going to need artists and musicians to entertain the people up there and also bring the people down here the experience of living in space. Because let's face it, space is cool! <laughs> it's
it's also complicated and messy and surprising and very much in need of all the skills that we have here and now on Earth, especially the skills of the people who don't quite have careers yet. Fortunately, when you ask seventh graders, who wants to go to Mars? You get a room full of raised hands and one kid going, no, 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 no. <laughs> to this young man and everyone who feels the same way, I say, how about a nice seat at Mission Control? <laughs> because for every one of us who goes up there, thousands remain on the ground. You communicate with us. You build the rockets that bring us supplies. You design and redesign the desks and the lights and the decorations that make it safe and comfortable for us to remain up there. So what I'm saying is even if you don't want to physically go up, if you are down for helping us grow food in zero G, if you want to invent microgravity surgery, if you have an idea for a better space toilet, <laughs> we'll take it, even if we can't take you. All of these things are being worked on on Earth right now. And we can use all the help we can get. And last, if you would like to make a small donation to our drive to become an interplanetary species, please consider volunteering for a space simulation. <laughs> If you are an astronaut type person, the way we define them today, you can apply. We're all volunteers. Or if you don't have months to spare, you can become our mission control. Or you can take a moment out of your day and reach out to one of us living what feels like very far away. You can find our blog and send us a note. Just say hi. When you see nothing outside of your portal except for red rocks and black space, Earth feels very far away. And those words of kindness that came to me from people I'd never met meant the world to me, literally. Lastly, speaking of kindness, if your loved one, child or spouse is accepted to the space mission, or to a simulated mission for a year on Mars, be supportive. <laughs> the requirements for life in space have changed. And so the rules have changed. And for the first time in history, those of us who need space stand a real chance at going there. Because for the first time ever, space needs us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, bye, honey. Bye, Mom. <laughs>